let's continue with visualization analysis and design for arranging tables on uh, a spatial display. So we started out in our last segment, we talked a lot about rectilinear orientations of the axes, of lists, of matrices. Now let's also talk about radial orientation. So first let's start with just the direct analogs of a bar chart in a radial mode. Um, so in a star plot, you basically have a mark that's a line and the radial axes all meet at a central point. In a radial bar chart, we still have a line mark, but the radial axes are meeting in some central ring. And so what's going on here structurally is instead of having a bar chart where we've got rectilinear axes and vertical alignment of those heights, we're now distributing these bars around in a circle, right? So the channel is no longer horizontal and uh, vertical spatial position. It's now, we, we do have length, but we're using the angle to mean something. So what do we call that angle or tilt or orientation? Now, the issue here is that we have high precision ability to tell aligned positions apart, but we do not have that kind of high precision to tell um, the lengths when we've got these sort of radial arrangements. So uh, we are less able to read out those like length values. So in a, a radar plot is a related idiom where it's basically a radial line chart. Um, now, sometimes these are called spider plots or various other names, but the key thing here is it's basically a radial line chart where you still have a point mark connected by line segments, but now we're wrapping around again using the angle instead of distributing it across a two-dimensional line. So there's this similar problem if the data is cyclic, that actually tells you something about the connecting up, and then it can be worth it to have that reduced ability to tell the lengths apart. If the data is not intrinsically cyclic, it is typically much harder to understand, and usually the benefits are not worth it. So uh, some people have gone so far as to say, you know, ignore, avoid radar graphs 99.9% .9 of the time was an argument from Alberto Cairo, a data journalist who did this redesign comparing the radial version of the plot that you see above to this rectilinear version below. Um, and this question of, you know, how are you more able to actually tell apart what's going on? Uh, there is a lot that is easier to directly perceive with that rectilinear layout. And that brings us to the pie chart, a uh, much debated uh, radial layout. So from a structural point of view, let's understand what's a pie chart. Now, instead of something where we've got these line marks, we've got area marks. We're actually directly changing the angle of the pie chart wedges, uh, which means that what's getting encoded are these areas. Um, and so the two-dimensional area varies of these wedge-shaped regions. So we've, we're still separating into regions and we're ordering them um, and their height is uniform, right? It goes all the way out to the outside of the bar chart. So we're definitely less able to perceive area than we are able to perceive rectilinear aligned length. So we had rectilinear aligned length is very high precision. Um, radial non-aligned length is less than that, medium precision, and area is actually even lower precision. So for this task of part to whole judgment, which is what pie charts are all about. Um, the question is, you know, are we actually getting our money's worth for this, which we'll talk about in just a sec. But what I want to do is compare what's happening in a pie chart to its less well-known cousin, um, often called the coxcomb chart or a Nightingale Rose. And this is a more direct analog to a bar chart, uh, where what we do is we are still actually using a line mark. We're actually judging the length, uh, or at least we're supposed to judge the length of these. So they are separated and ordered radially. The width is uniform and the length varies according to the data. So it really is a direct analog to a radial bar chart. Again, with all of these, we've got a categorical key attribute and a quantitative value attribute. Now this uh, coxcomb plot, sometimes it's called a nightingale rose or a polar area chart, if you wanna be a bit more uh, precise about that. Um, let's understand what's going on here because 
here's where we get to the difference between what you, the designer, are trying to encode and what the user's eyes might be decoding. So in a coxcomb plot, what is being encoded is these one-dimensional lengths of these wedges. It's the length of the wedge. But what people are often decoding is this two-dimensional area of the wedge. And here's the problem. It's non-uniform. The width of that sector, that kind of line style mark in the, se in the sector, that width increases as the length increases so that the variation in area is non-linear with respect to the length of the mark. And that's the big difference is you've got non-uniform widths for these coxcomb charts, whereas you have uniform widths in a standard bar chart. So as the length increases, the area increases and it's linear with, with each other and you're all set. There's no confusing disparities. And so, you know, with radial bar charts, you still have uniform width as the length increases. It's only with these coxcomb charts that you don't. So in general, the safer thing to do is to avoid these nonlinearities, avoid non-uniform widths. If you're not trying to explicitly encode something, if this is just sort of coming along for the ride with the way you chose to visually encode it, that's where you see the perceptual problem. So people have also studied, what are people doing when they're actually perceiving uh, pie charts? Are they actually decoding the area or maybe they're decoding something else? Um, so there's some empirical evidence that what people are really responding to is the arc length on the outside of the circle, um, more so uh, than just the angle. Um, maybe they're also getting the area. Um, any of these is less able to be perceived precisely than, of course, these uh, rectilinear lengths. Um, and it's worth noting that things like donut charts, where you don't have that hole in the middle, um, are no worse than pie charts, according to this empirical analysis. So uh, for those who are interested, there's sort of a nice paper in trying to tease out what's actually happening perceptually uh, in terms of, are you looking at angles or areas? Um, from a designer's point of view, the really crucial question is, when would you use these at all? And so best practices for pie charts is if you really only have a very small number of levels, these can be completely legitimate if you don't need super fine grained ability to um, make judgments about the exact differences. And what you're really trying to do is a part to whole task. What part, if, especially if you just have two levels, you know, what is the relationship between the part and the whole? People are actually quite good at that. But if you have several levels and the details matter, like in this uh, great example here, where it's incredibly hard to tell apart A, B, and C from the pie charts, but it's pretty trivial to tell uh, what's going on from the bar charts, this is a good example of where you would not use a pie chart. And of course, once you have many levels, it's hopeless, and this is not at all your best choice. So an interesting comparator is, well, what would be something you could do that would also get at this part to whole task, but that would be a different visual encoding? And so you can take this idea of a stacked bar chart that we already saw and in the last segment and normalize that to the full vertical height so that you're getting the ability to look at these part to whole relationships. What's interesting about this is going back to a point I made several segments ago about information density. How many pixels do you need to show this data? So in that uh, normalized stacked bars above me, we're actually seeing all 50 US states and we're looking at demographic data for all of them. Now notice how in the lower right, I'm comparing just one of those stacked bars to an entire pie chart, which requires far more pixels to actually show that same information. So. Um, you can really think about information density as you would ponder if you're looking at not just one single one, but many, how could you do that compactly? And so this is a place where you see that the normalized stack bars are a much more compact visual representation. So I've been telling you about when you should be careful about radial displays, but when are they useful? And the answer comes when you're dealing with cyclic patterns. Here's a particular uh, radial approach called glyph maps. And uh, the figure from this paper really emphasizes some of the strengths and weaknesses of rectilinear versus radial. <clears throat> now, rectilinear is great for understanding when the trends are linear, as we see in those first uh, eight versus, or actually, sorry, linear in the first four versus nonlinear, uh, which we see in the next four. Um, very, very, very obvious. Um, that's much less obvious in that glyph map below where we're basically doing the same thing radially. But 
uh, it's very hard to evaluate, evaluate periodicity um, with those charts, those last four charts um, up above, you know, well, we see it squiggles, but hard to notice too much. Whereas noticing when do these cycles actually match up is something we're able to see much better in those glyph maps below with those trefoil shapes and noticing when uh, things end or begin uh, before one another. So there are good use cases for radial displays. You just have to be careful to understand their strengths and weaknesses. Now let's talk about another kind of orientation. What about parallel axes? So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, there's an idiom called a SPLOM for short, a scatter plot matrix. Um, and in this, we take many scatter plots and we put uh, many of them together. So this is a rectilinear approach. If we've got many attributes, what we would want to do is look at all possible pairs of attributes. Um, so a matrix of scatter plots is where each cell in the matrix actually has an entire scatter plot within it. Um, and let's think about the scale of that. Well, at some point you run out of room, right? Let's say you have a dozen attributes. Well, that would mean that um, you would need to have, you know, 12 times 12 is 144 of these little charts. And at some point the chart becomes small enough that there's a limit as to how many of these little item point marks you could fit within these small charts and still actually be able to see it and not have it just be hopelessly overplotted. So using our metric of say a thousand by a thousand pixels, let's say we could maybe fit up to a dozen um, attributes and but maybe only dozens or max hundreds of items within each. Um, we're not gonna be able to have thousands of points in each of 144, or even if we only need the lower triangular part of uh, half of that, um, we still would be really limited by the amount of pixels we have. So there's an alternative. Um, parallel coordinates is an idea to try to get uh, beyond some of these limitations of rectilinear axes. So instead of saying, well, we need our axes to be at right angles to each other with orthogonal axes, um, what if we said, well, we could line up these axes in parallel, and then we could show many attributes using that high precision spatial uh, position layout um, so here we see an example of a SPLOM versus parallel coordinates for this very small data set of grades in four different classes uh, for five different people. And what we can see is that in the scatter plot matrix, um, we separately have plotted each of these pairwise, uh, these attribute pairs. Um, and in the parallel coordinates, what we do is we encode what was a point on many of these different uh, scatter plots on the SPLOM on the left, we now say we, for each one of these axes, we plot its value as it crosses that axis, and then we connect up those with line segments. So we basically a single item is shown with a jagged line on the parallel coordinate view, um, as opposed to showing the item in a point, um, but across multiple different uh, scatter plots, which is what we have on the left. Now, from a scale point of view, um, we could fit dozens of attributes, not just you know 10 or 12, but we could actually have many of these lines going across. And we could fit probably hundreds of these jagged lines representing items before we get too much clutter and overplotting. Now, the challenge with parallel coordinates is, what order should those axes be in? Um, and this is a sort of intrinsic thing where it's easy to compare values between neighboring axes, it's much so math and physics is easy. Physics and dance is easy. Dance and drama is easy. But math and drama gets to be much harder because there's all that visual stuff happening in between. So correlation is something you can read directly off parallel coordinates. It does need to be explicitly taught. Of course, so did um, positive and negative correlation, but it is taught much more often. Um, and so in contrast to the scatter plot where you've got tight diagonal one way, tight diagonal the other way, and then spread out. With parallel coordinates, you see a really dramatically different picture. Positive correlation, perfect positive correlation is parallel line segments. And perfect negative correlation is that everything crosses at a halfway point as we see on the bottom here. And then uncorrelated is where you just have these scattered crossings as we see in the middle. So definitely that's something that people do not typically start out familiar with and would need to be explicitly taught. 
So the axis ordering, as I said, it's tricky because it's only the neighboring axis pairs that really uh, shed a lot of light on that. So you can sometimes say, well, you could reorder the axes interactively, let people just hunt around. Um, in the worst case, though, that actually degenerates into human powered search where you would have to just systematically go through each and try to remember it. So certainly you could try to approach this algorithmically. There have been um, algorithms proposed that sort of partially address this. Uh, but fundamentally, this comes down to the, both the strength and the weakness is that you're showing much more at once, but you've got this uh, real asymmetry between the pairs that are close to each other and then the pairs that are further away. So thinking more globally about orientation, well, you know, what are the limits of each of these approaches? Rectilinear is sort of familiar and obvious, um, but you really hit the limits with the number of axes. Two axes is great. We'll talk more when we get to rules of thumb about some of the challenges of 3D uh, in this case, and then four or more is impossible just directly as a scatter plot. With parallel coordinates, well, there's this unfamiliarity issue. It certainly takes training time uh, to deal with that particular uh, interpretation of this idiom. And then with radial, there are these interesting perceptual limits where um, there's a number of asymmetries here. Um, with this sort of polar coordinate approach of radius and then orientation, you know, your ability to read off the angle is a lower precision thing than your ability to read off length. Um, and you have to be very careful about that non-uniform width uh, that I alluded to when you're using something that's the equivalent of a line mark. Um, but sometimes you could actually exploit some of these asymmetries. For example, um, what if you have two attributes that are really not equally important? If you, here was a nice study about the strengths and weaknesses of radial visualizations where they compared you know, finding things on a rectilinear grid, as we see on the bottom, with finding things on a one of these radio layouts. So if you have something where you want to um, have them um, pay much more attention to one of these attributes than another, then it might be a reasonable thing to actually have these this radial asymmetry. Um, so you can think about situation, for example, what if you've got something where you need an increasing amount of room as you go into depth with a tree? That's one reason why some radial tree layouts are very um, popular because as you go further out from the root, um, you actually get more and more room on these outer sectors. That would be an example where you want to have this property of a lot more width as you get towards the outside than towards the inside. So in general, things are never bad per se. They're bad when they're a bad match with your goals. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about layout density um, and uh, you know, dense versus sparse. So let's have an example here of um, where what we've done is we've taken a uh, large amount of software. So we're actually thinking about code and lines of code. So we've taken textual data and we've derived something. We're saying we've got a line of code and there's one quantitative attribute. In this case, it's whether it, how, how, whether it um, passed or failed tests some percentage of the time uh, with some sort of unit testing. And so we've derived data from this. We've actually got, uh, we've said, we're gonna take this readable line of code and we're gonna turn it into just a line where the length of that line has to do with how literally how many characters that line of code was. And then we are able to color code it by this attribute, in this case, test coverage. And the thing to notice is we have this very, very, very compact representation, right? We can fit like 10,000 lines of code in this. Of course, we can't read the lines of code. There's a little detail view in the lower left that allows you to interactively, you know, click on part of this overview and then see that in particular. Um, but the key thing is that we're able to see these overall patterns for where lines of code uh, did either a great or a medium or a poor job of actually passing all of these texts, these tests. And so this is an example of a very dense, these are sometimes called pixel oriented uh, layout where you really are um, aggressively having a very small number of pixels show something. And often these are done uh, in conjunction with some kind of interaction so that you can query and actually see more detail. So we'll be talking more about interaction in a bit, but this is just to get you to think about density versus sparsity of a visual representation and how far can you go. So 
we've gone through and we've talked about a lot of different issues with arranging tabular data spatially. Um, and this was really focused on the spatial layout. We'll talk about other channels in a bit. So you could either just express a single quantitative value. You could have this idea that you're separating it into spatial regions, which then could also optionally be ordered and aligned. We talked about these different bases of the layouts, whether you've got uh, one key being used to order a list or two keys being used to order a 2D matrix. Talked about different axis orientations of rectilinear and parallel and radial. And we talked about this idea of dense layouts. So we've started on this big question of how do you actually um, encode and interact with data? So we've now covered some of, part of that territory, specifically thinking about in the visual encodings, which are on the left in this big diagram, about how it is that for tabular data, we could arrange things with uh, expressing something quantitative and then separating out and ordering and aligning. 